One, my name is Alex Levchenko. I'm one of uh, four interventional physiatrists at ONS, and um, I'm going to give a talk on regenerative medicine. Um, Dr. Sethi uh, and uh, Dr. Green already kind of touched upon that um, a bit in their talks, but I'm going to go a little bit more in details on that. So, really, the regenerative medicine as it is has been around for a while. But um, I'm going to start with platelet-rich plasma, since that one has been the most studied. And really, it's been tremendous growth in the latest years. And if you look at the data, um, the beginning use of PRP started in, um, in 87 um, in veterinary medicine. And now it really moved on into orthopedics, into musculoskeletal medicine, even into cosmetics. You know, you see Kim Kardashian and uh, uh, the vampire facial, um, that's, that's your PRP. Not exactly what we think of in, uh, in the world of orthopedics. But it really ha what, what PRP does, um, platelet-rich plasma, it has a lot of growth factors in it. And really what it does, it really enhances and expedites the wound healing process in the body. And it has been shown to be beneficial in osteoarthritis, tendinopathy, chondropathy, acute and chronic soft tissue injuries, and as well as muscle and ligamentous tears. Just a quick intro how it's done. Uh, what, what PRP is in itself? Well, it's really the autologous blood, blood taken from the patient. It's prepared in a certain way, usually in a centrifuge, where it's concentrated, and the layers are being separated. So if you look on the screen right here, uh, this is something that would usually come out from the, uh, from the centrifuge. This is the centrifuge. And then prior we do it, so we draw the blood from the patient, we put it in the centrifuge, then they spin it. And then um, it separates the layers, so the red blood cells would be on the bottom. Then the, uh, the buffy coat would be the actual platelets in the white blood cells. And then the top layer would be the platelet poor plasma, where we would have the, um, also the growth factors concentrated. So, um, and, and, and there are different variations in, um, in, the, in the formulation. So, but the ones that we really look at uh, how much white blood cells are in there. And uh, it could be bad, or it, could be, or it could be good, depending on what you're going to use um, that particular formulation for. Um, and, and the inclusion of the white blood cells usually varies by the, by the indication or, or the procedure that you're going to, or the body part that you're going to treat. So, and, and that's actually a problem. So there are about 40 commercial PRP systems on the market right now, and probably more being added as we speak. And um, the, the preparations, they vary in the growth factor concentrations, the presence or levels of the red blood cells, uh, white blood cells, and the actual platelets. Um, and, and the fact is that PRP, and, and, and in fact, any of the regenerative medicine, it is not under oversight uh, by FDA. Uh, so there is no one really there who would enforce quality or efficacy or consistency of the formulations that are being used. And really that presents the problem because when you get into the studies and you start looking at the outcomes, it's very, very difficult to compare one study to the, to the other. And the reason being is that because of all of these different formulations and inconsistency in actually how much of the good stuff or the bad stuff you have in there. So PRP has been used in osteoarthritis. Um, the thought is that there are a lot of growth factors in there that promotes the joint repair. Well, now we get to the question of well, how many injections would you need to do? So I've looked at the latest studies as well as the comparative studies and meta-analysis, and this is some of the data that I was able to get out. So pretty much in, uh, you know, Talking about the osteoarthritis, we always have to think about the, well, how bad is it? Is it mild? Is it moderate? Is it severe? Are we bone on bone? Is there any difference how you're going to approach in treating that? And yes, yes, there are differences. So the easiest probably and the most consistent what the studies show is that if there is early osteoarthritis, then one PRP injection is likely going to be as efficacious as two or three or four, so it probably would not make a great of a difference. Now, if you get in more of a moderate kind of situation with osteoarthritis, what do we usually use for that? Well, you know, the standard of care, what we've been using for is, is the gel injections, the hyaluronic acid injections, the, the, your flexes, the, your 
Synvisc injections, so all of those are the, uh, the same formulations. Um, and when you, when you do head-to-head -head studies comparing the PRP injections to the gel injections, really lately in everything that I've seen being published, the PRP comes ahead. But again, it becomes the question of how many injections are you going to do? Usually when we do the gel injections, we do three of those, a series of three. Sometimes we do a series of one, but most often it's a series of three. And um, so when in comparative studies, it becomes a challenge because if you're, doing the, if you're blinding the patient as well as the physician, then you have to have the three injections of the gel and three injections of PRP. So that's where these numbers are coming from, is uh, there is a variation of how many injections they did, anywhere between two and four, three on average, comparing to the three injections of gel. And really, it seems like PRP is coming ahead and winning that game at both the six and 12 months interval. Now, there was, a, um, there was a study when they actually looked at the grade three arthritis, so moderate to severe, and, uh, and in that particular study, they actually did four PRP injections, and, and it appeared to be more beneficial than, uh, than uh, four gel injections. But again, the challenge here is that they did not pitch it against, well, what if we use the two PRP injections, and we did the four PRP injections, and, and then would there be any difference? So, but I think the consensus is that really, if you look in, if you if you look in at the early stages of osteoarthritis, probably you can get away with one PRP injection. Probably it's going to be more beneficial than the gel injection. But if you're getting more into mild to moderate and uh, early stages of or late stages of moderate and early stages of severe, then probably you would require an average sum of uh, three injections of the PRP. Now. I kind of glanced over that already. What about the leukocyte rich versus leukocyte poor? So those are your white blood cells. Does it really matter? And then it really goes down to, goes back to um, the inflammatory process and how the healing happens. And um, in uh, joint, if you want to have the heal the joint, we actually don't want the inflammation. However, if we're healing the, let's say, the soft tissue, a tendon, we do want to promote inflammation. And, um, and we're thinking that, Having the white blood cells uh, causing the inflammation would be beneficial in treating the soft tissue injuries and, and not so beneficial in treating the joint um, arthritis. So um, in our practice, actually, what we choose to do, we're using, we're using um, low leukocyte concentration for the PRP injections when we're doing the uh, joint injections because of that. Um, and uh, so kind of uh, going to the tendon treatments, um, it looked very, very promising in the beginning. Um, and then really the best benefit so far is, uh, has been shown in tennis elbow treatment. And um, when they put uh, and compared uh, PRP injections versus the steroid injections in the tennis elbow, the PRP came way, way ahead. Uh, the steroid injections, they, they work and they're great and we know that and the patients love them, however, there is a really high recurrence rate of the same issue coming back in about a year or two years down the road. And the PRP shows better outcome at that uh, time. So one to two years down the road after the injection. So PRP was found to be superior in treating tendinopathy of both the elbow, knee, and shoulder. Um, however, if the, it looked very promising with treating the Achilles tendinopathies as well. However, the latest studies uh, been very, very conflicting on that. So PRP and ligaments. Well, can you heal the torn ACL? Um, in theory, I mean, it looks promising and interesting because, uh, but the, a little disclaimer here, all the studies or successful studies uh, that we have on the use of PRP and, and ligamentous stair treatments been done in rats. So um, really nothing has been done in, 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 on a large scale or um, in humans. Um, but we do know that ligaments have a very, very poor blood supply, and PRP do improve the viability and functions of the cells that reside in the ACLs. So in theory, yes. In practice, we're not there yet. I'm going to get into the stem cell therapy. It uh, really has been around for about 60 years. Um, in, initially, it was uh, used to treat leukemia in the 1960s. Uh, but in reality, it can be used uh, to treat both bone and cartilage defects, osteoarthritis, tendon, and ligament injuries, as well as degenerative disc disease. Common sources uh, to source the stem cells would be the bone marrow, adipose cell, as well as the umbilical cord blood. 
So this is a little uh, picture about the little diagram how we would get the stem cells from the, uh, from the bone marrow. The first bone marrow aspirate uh, to be used in orthopedic procedure was done in 1986. Uh, the first treatment for the knee osteoarthritis was performed in 2002. Um, it really has to be done under the image guidance. That would be for the patient's safety. It takes about 20, 30 minutes uh, to harvest um, the cells and then uh, they process in a special centrifuge and then inject it. Um, in, uh, outside of the United States, there is another step. They want to actually culture the cells, and that's not something that's allowed uh, to do in the United States uh, by the FDA, just because then uh, manipulating the cells in any way would be considered of actually making a drug, um, and that would need to be uh, um, under the FDA oversight, and that's not the case yet. So, um, stale stem uh, therapy in osteoarthritis. Well, as we know, cartilage does not regenerate after the injury. Uh, however, it has been shown um, that the stem cells are able to repair damaged cartilage tissue and promote growth. And um, the interesting one of the studies that I actually saw again was done more in the animal model where it appeared that the stem cells um, actually targeted the damaged tissue inside the joint. Um, but in the studies, what has been shown is that the, the stem cell therapy um, looks very promising in slowing progression of osteoarthritis. Um, it also has been promising in terms of uh, meniscal injuries. Um, I saw a recent study, actually it was a case report that was presented at uh, one of the conferences uh, a couple of years ago, um, looking at the pictures at MRI pre and post uh, the injection um, in meniscal injury, and uh, there is a better... The MRI looked better, the patient felt better, there was much less pain, the patient was able to return to his young athlete, was able to return to his activities. Um, however, it's controversial what really worked because they injected everything under the sun. You know, they injected stem cells, they injected PRP, then um, they injected uh, gel, they, it was everything. And one of those things worked. So, but which one, we, we're not sure. So in the, <laughs> but, uh, but there is promise, and it can improve the pain, it can improve the range of motion, it, it can improve the overall function of the patient, but the best improvement is seen really at 6, 12, and 24 months, and there are really no good studies that show us anything beyond 24-month uh, period. So, but one thing we do know is that high dose of cells um, in the injections, usually they do better uh, than, the, than the less concentrated solution. And then we get into the amniotic preparation. So, um, the, when they, so you can see on the picture there's an amniotic sac and, uh, and uh, chorion. So they actually take that, they dehydrate it, and, uh, and what, what comes out is called dehydrated human amniotic chorionic membrane material. And it can be suspended back again in saline for the injection. Um, and uh, really going back, the amniotic... Uh, materials, they have been used a lot in the, um, in the burn and, and, and also treatments, um, and wound healing in general. But pretty much what you can do, so then you reconstitute the solution, and it, can, and it has been shown beneficial in both the plantar fasciitis, tendinopathy, as well as osteoarthritis. However, the studies are limited in terms of um, the follow-up. So really the studies that I've seen, they've been limited to, to just a few months follow-up, but it does appear to be promising. Um, and uh, one of the advantages compared, say, to PRP, you say, why would you use this instead of using PRP? Well, it, it's more consistent in terms of what you injected and how many cells are in there uh, versus the PRP. Because PRP, again, there are so many different systems on the market, so every time you make a preparation, you're not 100% sure um, what uh, concentration that you're using. And then another one is actually, so another amniotic preparation is when they take the amniotic fluid. And that one is very rich in uh, things like hyaluronic acid injections. So that has been used for the osteoarthritis and it thinks to promote the, again, sliding and gliding inside the joint and improving the mobility. In the end, there are really no long-term um, studies that are currently available to tell us how well this will long work in the long run. Everything has been limited to approximately 24 months. There is really nothing beyond that. Uh, but uh, the use of these therapies continue to grow just because there is a tremendous demand. Uh, the patients seek new treatments. Uh, the patients don't, would like to avoid surgery if they can. 
Um, and um, there are definitely promising results, but definitely more clinical studies needed. But I think the, the, the really the uh, take home message from this is uh, you have to, you know, the, the concentration of both the PRP as well as the stem cell material, that's probably the biggest uh, driving force in the, for the better outcomes uh, from the different interventions that we use these um, therapies for. That's it. Thank you.